Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Museum of Sonoma County's Museum Conversations. I'm Jeff Nathanson, Executive Director of the Museum, and we're very excited to um, welcome David Huffman, who is currently uh, exhibiting two paintings. Uh, they're uh, part of our permanent collection. Uh, these are two paintings in our current e exhibition, 35 Artists for 35 Years. Um, we, we did celebrate our 35th anniversary in 2020, and we continue the celebration of 35 years of bringing you art and history um, with this exhibition and into 2021. Uh, to, today, we're gonna be talking about um, David's work, uh, his, his life, um, his practice as an artist, and um, hopefully you'll you know, learn a couple of things about uh, this really exciting artist uh, from the East Bay who um, is, uh, we're really proud to have as part of our collection. And uh, welcome, David Huffman. Great, thanks, Jeff, appreciate it. Yeah, it's great Glad to, to see you. Here. Yeah, see um, we met in 2019 um, when I was uh, working on putting together the exhibition See Something, Say Something, which was uh, on view here in our uh, main galleries of our contemporary space. And uh, I was really excited to come to your studio. Uh, I had been familiar with your work and um, you just uh, to really see the body of work and get to know you. And you, told, you, you really uh, told me some fascinating um, stories about your upbringing in the East Bay. And uh, maybe we can just start there. Um, uh, tell, tell us about you know, where, you, where you grew up and uh, you connect, your, your mother's connection to the Black Panther Party. Uh, it's really fan fascinating. Yeah, um, so yeah, I grew up in the 60s, born in the 60s, early 60s um, in Berkeley, kind of like, you know, I have family in Oakland, Richmond, in San Francisco. So I was kind of like all over the place, but generally Berkeley was the home base uh, most of the time. And yeah, my mom, you know, she she was kind of an activist, um, kind of instigated by her sister, Norma, who was really the, the one who started her into a life of kind of like activism um, and who was also friends with Bobby Seale. And my mom also was friends with Bobby Seale, who was in Berkeley. He was actually, I'm not sure where he was from originally, but he lived in Berkeley um, during that time when they formulated uh, the Panther Party. So my mom being an artist um, did some stuff for them. Like she is probably the only woman or other person who's designed a Panther logo for a uh, protest for flags, for Huey Newton flags. In particular, I remember when she was making them and designing the Panther logo and had to redo them in a class, <laughs> a still screen class. Um, and, you know, just, we were we were really kind of like a family that had so many different types of people that came to our home and you know there's all these adult conversations that are going on and what i mean by that is like you know topics of the day and obviously berkeley and it was the epicenter of like a lot of the free speech movement and so we live right in the middle of that um so i you know i'd seen tear gas uh you know uh military blocking off streets like the white way and with their bayonets showing and then police and riot gear running in single and double file up and down telegraph avenue and i was terrified you know um as a little child watching this um so yeah i was we were right in the middle of it it was very interesting i mean there was times when people would bang on our front door and their eyes would be burning from the tear gas from tear gas you know with tears rolling down their cheeks and you know, and I just thought it was crazy people banging on our door, but actually, you know, these were protesters that were tear gassed by the police. Um, so, you know, we, we grew up in quite a turbulent time and a lot of interesting political, social political events were going on. And meanwhile, art was always part of the situation. Art, music, uh, protests were always kind of linked together during that time. Yeah, I, I had a particular um, interest uh, at the time um, when we met, uh, because there certainly was uh, plenty going on in, in terms of uh, issues of social justice and, and uh, the political, 
po political climate in this country, but um, things have really, um, I, they, they've changed dramatically uh, since then with, um, with the murder of jo George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and others um, and the, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement. So um, with your background and, and the content of a lot of your work, um, how do you see your relationship and, and your artwork uh, and um, I guess the way that you um, prioritize what you do with your life relative to these recent events? Well, I mean, for me, it definitely looked like a rebooting of the kind of 60s and early 70s kind of feel of civil rights, um, kind of protest um, feel. And I had always had like a social political kind of ingredients in my work even though the work kind of crosses the history of abstract painting, um, ideas of social justice, um, iconography that's connected to African-American culture, and just like a kind of a uh, amalgamation of various parts. So it wasn't new to me to think politically in the work. Um, I think when George Floyd was killed publicly and everyone's watched it in, in great detail, <clears throat> excuse me, it kind of galvanized, you know, another emotional experience, you know, it's like, how many of these do we have? You know, there's so many horrible killings that have been going on and lynchings and so on. It's like, this was another brutal moment. Um, I think it kind of caught people off guard because we were all quarantined and we, were, we really had nowhere else to look except for at that moment. And I was in the middle of just working on the paintings that I'd been working on and had been working on this one piece for like, I don't know, like two months or so, two and a half months. And when that happened, something just, you know, said this, this is his painting. This is about George. This, this really needs to be brought together to signify this moment. And so I, I kind of captured a quality that's not always common with making art for me, because I don't really take things that happen immediately into the work. I usually I'm affected in a certain way, it takes a little time to digest. There's only a few works that I will immediately, uh, thing events that I will immediately respond to in, in which to make work around. Um, this one was really quick. It just went right to the painting. And uh, for me, it just, it became, you know, a kind of eulogy for for George Floyd. So, so when did you um, complete this painting of, of George Floyd? This was last year. Yeah. Uh, it was pretty much, gosh, it, it may have even been a week after the incident. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, because I had already been working on the painting for two and a half months, and it didn't feel resolved, and I couldn't figure out what it needed. And when that event happened, it just stirred a certain kind of text um, resolution for the piece. You know, it seemed like I was already kind of connected to some of the the, the ingredients of, of like a, uh, we call a social geology of this, of the frictionist space that that murder seemed to have culminated in. And so putting his name, you know, right there in the painting, you know, right there at the bottom foreground, uh, just solved that painting. Um, so, yeah, and you know, like I, you've seen some of the work before when I deal with things like I can't breathe, I was doing work you know, utilizing that text since, you know, 2015 um, and have been doing a lot of work with that and then thinking about Colin, about Colin Kaepernick taking the knee and so on. So it made sense in the sense of what I've been up to, to somehow capture George uh, Floyd. And, and then also Breonna Taylor, you know, Breonna Taylor was another person who I felt like a painting eulogy needed to occur. Um, but again, it's more like the way that I, I make these, what I can consider social abstract paintings with all these various ingredients connecting to, you know, the history of abstract painting as well as social justice. Um, those just, those paintings just happen naturally. Yeah, and, and that makes sense to me, um, looking at them and um, seeing that, uh, that connection to the work that you had done previously um, well, let's talk about some of that previous work. Uh, in in the exhibition, you were um, 
you were exhibiting um, with uh, two other artists in 2019, uh, See Something, yeah. Say Something. And for those who weren't able to see the exhibition, the premise of, of this show was that there are threats to society besides what Homeland Security tells us, bombs and, and terrorist attacks. And so uh, the artists in the show, yourself included, uh, David, um, we're really looking at things like uh, racism, social injustice, income inequality, um, I identity, uh, gun violence, um, cli uh, climate change, um, all of these different issues. Uh, and, and so uh, the other artists uh, in the show had their own points of view, but certainly, uh, David, I think um, in, a, in a way uh, you created almost uh, the centerpiece of the show with your basketball pyramid. So maybe uh, let's, that's very different than the paintings, but uh, the connection thematically and, and in terms of what you are doing uh, you know, to, as you talk about um, issues of social injustice or, or race, um, let, let's talk about the pyramid and then we can get to some of those other paintings. Yeah. Um, yeah, liberation's the name of that particular pyramid because that's red, black, and green, which are based on, you know, Pan-African freedom fighting or what do you call uh, African consciousness uh, that was adopted with a global consciousness on African identity. Um, it just it just made sense in, in in the way that I've been using basketball as a signifier to African American culture. Um, and I had done pyramids in my early narrative paintings and I um, decided to make a physical pyramid, basically was instigated by an exhibition I did in San Francisco. Um, and so once I did that first pyramid, I started thinking thematically about what other types of things that these pyramids could stand for. And mostly it was a connection to restate some of the concepts in archaeology about the pyramids in Egypt and, and calling, you know, the culture Egypt, which is mostly a Greek name for Kemet African, you know, culture, um, and to somehow create an identity connection between African Americans here with the global concept of being Black, um, and, and also connecting it to some things that are considered great artifacts of civilization. Uh, so the, the pyramid to me um, was is very personal because, you know, they're made out of basketballs, which is a kind of a funny thing, but it was kind of a conceptual material to kind of, like I said, you know, bring together African American culture and kind of signifying the connection to, you know, Egypt or Kemet. Um, and then having the you know, the sound component to the pyramid, which was Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech overlaid with Jupiter's largest moon, Ganymede, which was a feed from NASA. So I just try to, I guess, bring in my Afrofuturist kind of roots thrown in there too. Um, but yeah, I mean, I was super excited you guys were interested in doing the pyramid. It was pretty funny how we brought it together. And I, I certainly really thought it would look great in that space. Yeah, um, we, we were thrilled to have it. And uh, I, I, I really love uh, what you suggested uh, we, we do at the close of the exhibition, which was to donate the basketballs yes. to, yeah. um, to schools and, and uh, boys and girls club. And, and, and so local students could actually enjoy the basketballs and put them actually to the use they were actually made for, <laughs> which yes. is playing playing yes. a sport uh, and we so we partnered with uh, the Catholic Charities a couple of local schools and the Boys and Girls Club in Santa Rosa and um, out there in 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 our region there's 600 some odd <laughs> basketballs uh, that well unfortunately not a lot of kids are in school right now but um, hopefully they'll be back in 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 action sometime in the near future uh, you, you know, you mentioned the, the moons of um, Jupiter and Ganymede. I 
just to have to ask an aside, have you been watching the, or have you watched The Expanse? I have not. Oh. Um, Wait, what is The uh, Expanse? Well, uh, your interest in uh, Afrofuturism um, and uh, such celestial uh, topics. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Check it out. I, um, I mean, unfortunately, I haven't been able to indulge all my interests since we've been in this you know, pandemic moment of, cause I have a daughter and she's in school and I'm a teacher full time. So, you know, it's, it's much harder for me to, to, to catch up on a lot of stuff, but that sounds something I might be checking out. Yeah. It's, it's, it's edgy sci-fi, but anyway, back to your work. Uh, so, uh, uh, just a little bit more about, uh, li liberation. Uh, yep. the installation is not just the, basketballs in a pyramid form, but there's also a soundtrack. And can yeah. you talk about the soundtrack for a moment? Yeah, the soundtrack. Um, so I guess I was thinking about the conversations around Egypt, around aliens, about pyramids being built by aliens, or uh, just other worldly people that have less connection to the African identity. Um, and to try to reboot some of the narrative by injecting certain ideas of blackness into it. And, and for me, Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech is such a profound, lofty consideration that I felt like the pyramid is also profound and lofty too, that it also would be curious to have it echo from the pyramid itself. Um, and, and as a way to like gain access to you know, some of these direct values of who we are as a people, because the thing about slavery, it kind of ruptured the continuity of culture from Black Africa and the things that people were doing and the cultures of the, you know, the language, the food, whatever rituals that people needed to do in order to be alive were all decimated and kind of severed and brought and neutralized. And, and so you, you, you create this kind of amnesia identity and I guess in some ways this was a way to kind of like tweak that to, to put a chink in the armor of amnesia of, of you know of identity when it comes to where where we coming from and um and to insert a sense of pride too um because martin luther king definitely with his you know beautiful speeches definitely empowers the person listening you know either white or black or whatever you know um so i guess in a way i i felt like he still echoes in some fashion, like somewhere in, in the visible ethers of time. And I was trying to capture a little bit of that. And the idea of the sound feed from Ganymede was also a kind of nuance of capturing too. So like, wow, if I can get sound feed from that, then why not Martin Luther King's speech? Like almost they still, I mean, obviously Ganymede still exists, right? But maybe Martin Luther King, his speech is still going on somewhere in the universe. Um, and so I was trying to, I guess, create a more of a sci-fi link that favors, you know, black identity rather than to launch it away from black culture. Um, yeah, so thoughts like that. Yeah, I, I found it really, um, really a successful uh, installation, and uh, I, I, I definitely appreciated that there was a sound component that uh, was otherworldly. Um, mm -hmm. Some, something about the solidity of this pyramid um, and the um, seemed very grounded to me in terms of the materials in in the use of basketballs uh, yeah. as sort of the building blocks. And it's like, okay, this is so earthbound. <laughs> and, yet, and there's this soundtrack yeah. that was really kind of ethereal and, and um, made you I, I kept looking around going, where is that coming from? Uh, I mean, I knew, but yeah. it still had that, that, that effect. Uh, so the, um, there are a couple of other works in the show uh, in particular uh, that, uh, for example, Abracadabra, I remember um, really having a, a, a pretty, uh, you know, a, a pretty loud social justice message about it. And um, perhaps you can talk about that for, for a moment. Yeah, Abracadabra um, 
which is like about seven by six foot work on canvas was for me a kind of transition in my what I call my ongoing investigation to the social abstract painting um, where I utilized the image of the cotton gin, Eli Whitney's cotton gin, which was created during the time of slavery. And, and the, I guess the, some of the history of the cotton gin um, when I was in school was like Eli Whitney was this good guy who made this cotton gin. So it made it easier for slaves to divide you know, the cotton from the seed where they don't get pricked so much with their fingers because it's a prickly you know, thing to do. And it hurts their hands and their hands would be bleeding from picking cotton, you know, all day for free. <laughs> Don't forget that part. And so, which sounded great, you know what I mean? Like as a person who, if I thought myself, if I thought I was, you know, picking cotton and someone came up with an invention and they made it easier, you'd think it'd be easier for me. But what happened simultaneously with this invention was that because of the ease of the separation between the cotton and the other parts, um, it made it more rapid in the sense of how cotton became, um, you know, uh, accessible. And so they needed more slaves in order to continue this process. So Eli Whitney actually, in, without knowing it, created a need for more slaves and it increased slavery, you know, tenfold pretty much because of the, the invention of the cotton gin. And I think I just kind of got curious about, you know, the idea of invention you know in its own right in like the wake of what it can have during a certain amount of time like i hadn't you know thought of all of them but i was certainly surprised that eli whitney's cotton gin actually instigated more slavery rather than creating more sense of humanity which most of our inventions are about you know to make it easier on all people um so that pretty much populated I think about 60, 65% of that painting and the rest of it moves into what I consider more like ideas of abstract painting, the historical ideas of hard edge abstraction and so on. But um, mostly it was the cotton gin that pretty much is, is um, foreground in that piece. Yeah, I think uh, it's, it's really interesting to me to see the way that you play um, the imagery that is referencing or, or uh, connected to what you're trying to say about race or social justice or history and the abstract composition uh, and how your interest in uh, abstract painting and uh, how that's evolved. Uh, it, it comes together quite successfully in, in, in the abracadabra piece and um, then I'm looking at the uh, work that's behind you, and uh, I can't help but ask you to maybe say a few words about what we're looking at uh, as your backdrop. Well, this piece behind me, there are actually two pieces, they're separate, um, uh, but they're part of a, my ongoing investigation, not only with social abstraction, but a new aspect of it. And I'm thinking about archeology, span and some of the, um, the issues, the prejudices that can occur through archeology, span um, especially when it comes to the greatness of black culture. And so I'm using the Sphinx um, in, this, in these particular paintings. And the reason why the Sphinx is because my mom has this profile and she occasionally, you know, I occasionally catch her in it and it looks dead on the Sphinx. And I've never seen a human being who had a profile that looked like the Sphinx, except for my mom. And so I became really intrigued and I've been thinking about it for years and have not been able to get around to thinking of, about how to utilize it. And it just kind of came as I've been looking at new research into archeology span and the idea that the Sphinx is one of these contentious arguments about time uh, dating, like, they can't figure out how old the Sphinx is. And general Egyptologists always position it with all the linear ideas of history, but there are all these geologists who really carbon date, who do these, like what do you call physical science to surfaces who find what I consider non-prejudice dates. And they're saying that a water erosion, what have you, predates the, the, the pyramids perhaps, you know, that is much older. 
And so it becomes a speculative chink in the armor, an idea to revalue these linear systems and um, and to also, you know, like like stir up the conversation of history and the narrative of that. So um, my mom being the instigator, but at the same time, you know, being curious about archaeology and, and connected to, you know, Africa in particular. So the one that's on my that I'm pointing at now, that one's not done, but the one on the right is. Okay, um, so it's uh, great to, to see the work in progress. Um, thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah, and I just want to say that I also use a lot of the fabrics that I use are all African fabrics from different parts of Africa that really speak to the language of abstraction, which a lot of modern art has been born from the culmination of thinking about African art and linear progression of painting and Asian art in particular as well. So for me, it's like there are these cloths that have an innate abstraction to them that are culturally derived. So I, I'm always um, utilizing them in, in, for my works as well. So they're part of the, the collage aspect of the piece. Yeah, and, and it's probably not very apparent to our viewers who haven't seen your work in person, but um, yeah. if you can talk a little bit more about uh, the materials that you use in your paintings uh, and um, the, to the extent that you can describe it without actually having a demo in your studio <laughs> which is well maybe we can no, do that's, that's totally fine so one thing i can say that when i started moving into what i consider more abstract works that were non-narrative is that i pretty much carried the backgrounds of my narrative works that i've been doing which i use a lot of wash kind of like more expressionistic manner of creating spaces like a warshack kind of read i would look at it and it would offer me possibilities of treating it in a certain way, I would respond to it. And I'd also embed glitter into it. So that became part of the way that I, I worked abstractly. And I would add the basketball as a way to find character or to utilize color and to also think about a depth of field. Um, and then they move more into other aspects of you know, materials like thinking about the cloth, the kente cloth was one of the first ones that I utilized. And for me, I was thinking about African identity because the thing about being an African American this is my own particular thought on is that we have, or I have a link to Africa in a way that I think is a lot more conceptual than people who are perhaps from like another country, like from Mexico or from China, where they have real family in those countries, but can be living in the United States. So they have like a dual, um, you know, not citizenship, but their dual connection. And for most black people in America, it's a conceptual space. It's a space of embracing with not having a relative that you can call on the phone or go visit or a, a village that is familiar to you, you know, things that carry on a kind of historical lineage. And that also becomes an identity space. And, and so for me, thinking about Africa in a way that is also a trope, you know, um, an idea that there's a longing, but there's the connections are of the entire continent and not about the specificity of parts of the landscape so much. Even though slaves were brought from very specific parts of Africa, um, but the idea of, of embracing the entire continent tends to be the norm. Um, so that became very interesting, but that's why I utilize a lot of the cloth. Um, and then when you see this other kind of pattern, what I call the basketball hoop net pattern, that was brought in um, through spray paint and utilizing real, um, you know, I'm using actual basketball hoop netting. I have, you know, thousands, <laughs> thousands of them. And I create patterns with them. And, and it's called orography in a sense of how it's it's created, which is basically a spraying procedure by blocking out. It's not stencil. Stencil is actually a facsimile of a concept, but a direct thing, the real thing is you when you use the real thing, it's more of an orography kind of situation. And I think it's a lot more connected to like cave painting where you see people have hands that are left in, in uh, detail and to some extent, you know, just kind of like the profile of the fingers. And that was because they sprayed pigment over it and they removed their hand and there you have it. Uh, similarly with 
with the um, net cabin. So I, I use cotton nets, I use chains, and the idea of like abstract expressionism or to have this fluid sense of how the paint should feel um, like it can be both um, big and small, like weather becomes, like this idea of conjuring up territory, non-location, like, you know, just like the history of, of painting strokes, um, hard edge abstraction. There's a lot of things on my mind that I'm trying to amalgamate into the piece as far as other materials. So I said um, spray paint, uh, gl uh, glitter, oil, acrylic, collage, um, uh, stamping, there's <laughs> drawing, there's quite a few things. And basically they are all part of what I've done throughout my life. Like I've always been a drawer, I've always done collage. I actually used to use glitter in the eighties a long time ago when they had it in a different form. So some things I had done um, a lot longer, you know, in, in my past that I've actually revisited and brought it in, into these, these new uh, works. Yeah, it's fascinating. Thank you. Um, uh, it, it's, it's really, uh, it, it, it's an exploration to look at your work um, up close, stand back, kind of get, you, <laughs> you end up getting kind of lost in the composition and the layers of materials and techniques. And it's, um, one, one of the things I really appreciate about uh, your work and, and, and a lot of artists who use uh, mixed media in unique and creative uh, ways is that it's it's hard to tell exactly what you were doing like how, how did you get that pattern or that technique and um, so I, well i just want to speak to that because i'm glad you can you can get some of that um because you know we're in very what I call clear political times where you know things that are happening, you can call it exactly what it is in a certain way, whether you deny it or not. That abstraction has a lot more nuance and like you were saying, the layering. I really want people to have an effect like the real life experience is. You know, you don't just have a political moment, you don't just have an aggressive moment. You have moments of peace, quiet that surround them that actually deliver their textual differences. So for me, I'm interested in undoing the, the viewer in a certain physical way, you know, to have a tactile experience, but to look um, into it. And as you look into it, you find that there are things involved, like whether it be a collar, Kaepernick taking the knee, or there's like um, an old a liquor store, or there's a, a police car, you know, various things that don't seem evident in the beginning, but as you look at it, you discover. And that to me is how life is life is all these kinds of qualities to it um but at the same time abstraction has always wanted to escape the world that you know it existed in and for me i wanted to do the opposite is to bring more of the world into abstraction so that abstraction doesn't just seem like for me you know uh, a place to escape but to actually grow into to find more stuff in it um and it's also just, you know, my own personal experiences and things that I care about that I put in. Yeah, so let, let's talk about the uh, work that has um, the Colin Kaepernick uh, image in it. Uh, is that uh, Mercy, Mercy Me? Um, yeah, so Mercy, Mercy Me, it's 60 by 60 inches uh, wood panel. Um, I did that piece as a, um, a new thought. I have been working mostly with basketball because the fact that African American culture has, in a in a in a in a word, you know, owns it now. <laughs> you know what I mean. And it's also brought it brought it to a new stature of performance. And to me, I see it as a kind of black ballet, but that's just how I feel about it. Um, and so things like football didn't really feel that way. It didn't feel the same kind of ownership. But the idea that football had a figure like Colin Kaepernick that started this new wave of activism intrigued me quite a bit. You know, the idea that you had these very conservative minds involved in the game and that they were being challenged in their most leisure, um, <clears throat> you know, their most leisure moments is to watch this football on Sunday and to be like totally free of, you know, whatever. But to have him take a knee was to bring them back to a certain kind of reality. And so, for me, Colin Kaepernick reminded me of like the 60s protests 
feel. It had this this idea this idea of like the single person putting up like a black power you know sign up, but he was taking the knee. So for me, that was a similar kind of connection. And the stamping, the design that I made, I wanted it to look more like something that you might find in the '60s. So I I you know used the afro, and um, a certain kind of um, I just say contrast to create a, a proper image that I could repeat over and over and that that repetition would also give you a space to kind of like dissolve in slightly. Yeah, it's a, it's a great piece. Um, we talked about the work that's behind you and uh, I don't want to uh, gloss over the work that's behind me. Um, uh, <laughs> right. So, uh, the one work is by Maria de Los Angeles, the larger of these uh, paintings. And uh, I just want to tell our viewers uh, that I hope that they'll uh, also watch a panel discussion that we are filming on March 18th. And uh, that will also include Linda Vallejo, who is in this exhibition with you right now and who is also uh, on uh, exhibit with you during the See Something, Say yeah. Something exhibition yes, uh, along with every Kwong. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, another artist who's been in a, a prior show with us, Donna Brookman, is also included in, in this exhibition, uh, 35 artists. But then your piece behind me, which is an untitled painting, uh, I feel it has a, a real connection to your exploration of abstraction, but it also um, includes uh, some imagery or iconography that uh, connects it to the, um, well, this, it's the social abstraction that you've been talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that painting was, uh, I did during my narrative painting uh, series. And those little red ships are watermelon slices that I've made into what I call watermelon UFOs. And I have been doing a series of them just like on the side. So I actually never showed them. I was just making them and Ron Casentini came by one day and, and saw that and really wanted it. So, um, and therefore you guys have it now. So, uh, but you're right, it, it became a way to think about placement, about, um, you know, territory, even though, you know, the watermelon UFO is a very specific narrative um, object. I was also thinking about, you know, movement. I was thinking abstractly, really. That painting needed to have a sense of movement and design to it that offered up an experience that was purely about that. Um, but because I was working with these narrative subjects that, you know, that was the only thing to, to, to allow me to um, give it a new kind of read, to be having it, to have it more as a, um, a locator of space rather than to only see it narratively as it is doing this or doing that. Yeah, and I'm glad that you uh, mentioned Ron Casentini because uh, he was very generous in, in donating this, uh, this painting. Uh, but he also donated another painting to our collection, which we um, are exhibiting now, uh, Military Maneuvers One. And uh, that has really more distinctly, uh, I would say, activist <laughs> imagery in it. Um, so uh, please uh, talk about um, this m military maneuvers. So military maneuvers, um, the, the subject is a, what I call a super robot. And it comes from thinking about the super robots in Japanese animation from the 70s, um, but also like early stuff like Astro Boy. And then thinking about Aunt Jemima and crossing those worlds together. And I created what I call Trauma Eve One. <laughs> and Trauma Eve One is based on the, uh, the notion of trauma that's related to slavery up through emancipation to, you know, trying to survive while being black in America. So trauma is basically is a nod to that concept. Um, and she was built by what I call trauma smile. So there's a whole backstory for that. And um, 
her idea of military maneuvers that she's a super robot and she's a military robot. And it's a lot of it is connected to her repressed um, origins. You know, the idea that Eve is like the whole reason why everyone's kicked out of the Garden of Eve, which is a huge burden on the woman. And then you put a black woman there as well, that you, you, you create this, this, what I call double frustrated uh, resistance. And the only character that to me makes sense for um, a person like that can't be passive. She has to be much more active and much more about battle. And Aunt Jemima has always been a passive character up until the point when um, it was Betty Czar who put her in a um, in an assemblage where she's holding a, a rifle, which to me became like that next level. And so for me, making Aunt Jemima a super robot was the level after that. So she's like what I consider the uh, end of the evolution of, of Aunt Jemima. And do you think that um, you turning her into a super robot has had any impact on the decision to, um, you know, take the Aunt Jemima branding away uh, for the syrup and uh, we no longer can see Aunt Jemima on the shelf. <laughs> well, I don't know if they've ever seen any of my stuff. <laughs> no, but it's, it, it's interesting to think about uh, these. Yeah, I mean, the thing about, maybe. yeah, there, the thing about African-American stereotype imagery, you know, from way back um, are very hostile images of inaccurate character reading of black culture and it's a terrible bridge for us to have to live with in order to be accepted you know um but at the same time they are signifiers of a process that white culture felt like they needed in order to embrace black people and for me i want to subvert that i wanted to say okay you wanted this kind of you know servitude character but i'm going to make her super powerful and dangerous i'm going to give her bombs and firing fi fists and also it's going to have a small figure who is human that goes into that robot and becomes empowered through the robot so it's a, it's empowering the black body is really what the super robots are about so i made her and then i made a male one called luxury dx um but yeah, that's, you know, that's the kind of stuff I've been thinking about. Yeah, and uh, I, certainly I made a little joke about it, but um, I know it's, it's serious business. And, and I, I actually appreciate that you're, um, you're also in a sense using humor in a way to maybe disarm the viewer to a certain degree. And yet you're presenting the viewer with something that really has serious intent and uh, and addresses something that has really been a, a, a terrible inequity in our society and has it's the, the change has been needed uh, for hundreds of years. So yeah. uh, we're, we're living through a time where this struggle just seems to be intensified and um, perhaps because of social media and television and uh, the mm availability of all of this content. Uh, and you said something earlier in this uh, conversation about we can, we're stuck in our homes because of COVID and you can't look away. And so it's a really interesting, um, it's an interesting time to be looking at the socio-political climate, what's happening around social uh, justice issues and, and your work and, and how you address the topic uh, in, in such a personal and yet universal manner. Mm. Um, one, one other thing before um, we wrap this up, I, I've been in, intrigued by your video work uh, around the trauma knots and, and I know you, you have these backstories and you've also talked about uh, the environment and I love your tra trauma knot hugging trees. Uh, so it, are you doing video work right now? And, and um, um, I, I'd on? like to do some more, but I don't have a lot of the time because I, I teach full time too. And painting 
takes up so much of my conscious awareness. You know, there's so much work to get done there. Um, but I still have my suit that I use for those videos, which I'm going to do some more stuff with. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I would like to do more video work for sure. Yeah. I, I mean, I love video. I really do. And, um, I have a show that I'm going to be doing, I think in the summer, depending on the pandemic at the Berkeley Arts Center and it's called Afro Hippie. Um, and it's going to be, you know, we're going to build a pyramid. We're going to do things that are connected to what I call the Afrofuturist kind of aesthetics that have been permeating a lot of, you know, black artists these days. And I've been interested in, you know, sci-fi kind of related material forever. Um, so I will have some new video for that show. And, um, but I'm not sure exactly how, you know, it's not done yet. There's just uh, studies at this point. And they're not going to be like all trauma not related. There'll be other qualities to it. I look forward to seeing what you do. And now, um, I, I understand that you also were supposed to have a show at uh, MOAD at the Museum yeah. of the African Diaspora. Is, um, has that been rescheduled? Uh, the pandemic has slowed everything down. It was supposed to open at a certain point, then it got put off. It was going to open again. It got put off, you know, because of everything that's been happening. Um, so we're looking at perhaps the summer where that show. So I guess technically I'll be having like <laughs> all these shows during the summer. Um, but they have all the work, so I don't have to make anything for that, which is beautiful. Um, but that's going to be all my trauma not work. It's, just, it's stuff that I have been doing with um, the astronauts and, and both the uh, astronauts and the robots. And they have one of my seminal paintings, which is a four panel wood um, screen, standing, freestanding screen. And it was done as a reflection on the Katrina disaster. And it was pretty much, I guess, one of the first uh, pieces made of the Katrina disaster is called uh, Katrina, Katrina, girl, you're on my mind. There, and that's a great piece. I love that piece. <laughs> uh, so, one last question for you before we wrap this up. Uh, you had mentioned that you you teach at CCA at California College yeah. of the Arts, and um, has the experience of teaching and uh, your interaction with students had any impact or influence on the way you make your work over over time? I mean, that I mean, it's a tricky question because it sounds like a a math question of parts that equal something. And that's a very direct way of whether you know this, did this or that. I can definitely say that teaching is something of my life experience. And the things that happen in my class, depending on who it is and what they're up to, definitely can open me up to a parameter of my own thinking. Um, but it is a job that I do as a profession. So you know, I'm not thinking so much about myself ever. I'm thinking about them. And in order to do it well, I have to do it that way. And that's what I prefer. Um, but generally, the lifestyle of a, being an instructor and being an, an artist really works well together for me. Whereas if I did anything else as work other than that, it probably would be you know, not as a positive effect on what I do in the studio. So it, it definitely, I, I think one thing I can say it, it, it does deliberately is like it gets me wanting to be in the studio um, because they work and I want to be working too. But occasionally you get amazing students that are just, um, it's, it's, I guess it's just about the human spirit. You know, you see these, these students come in and they have ideas and some have crazy, crazy ideas and they work hard and and it's great to watch, you know, um, it's great to watch someone blossom and grow and, and, and become compelled by their own creative process. Yeah. Um, and it's, I mean, it's a great school too, you know, CCA of all, you know, it, it's, it's just a great place. You know, they let you get stuff done that you need to get done. They, they care about you in a way that they want you to make your work so that you're, in some way connected to the process of creativity. For me, that's important because I, 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 I know that if I didn't make art, I'm not as effective in my classroom. Um, so as I make art, I'm a better instructor for sure. 
And with that <laughs> very inspiring comment, <laughs> I think our time is up, but uh, I do want to thank you so much, David, for taking time to um, have this conversation with me. And I want to thank all of our viewers for uh, tuning in and checking out uh, David Huffman's work. Uh, his work uh, continues on view in the exhibition 35, 35 Artists for 35 Years. Uh, you can see it online uh, on our website, museumsc.org. And there are plenty of virtual programs, oral histories, art instruction uh, lessons from various uh, artist teachers that we have as well as some 3D virtual tours, which are really fun. And, um, and one of my favorites, the virtual escape room, which is really about exploration of our collection. We are a Smithsonian affiliate museum. We thank all of our donors and members for their support. And we thank you for tuning in. I'm Jeff Nathanson. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jeff.